on this side of uh, on this side of the Atlantic. Uh, welcome to the November meeting of the Dubai Natural History Group. I'm extremely uh, pleased to uh, to say that we seem to have we seem to have turned a corner uh, uh, corner around the the pandemic. Dubai uh, statistics are getting better, and we conducted our first uh, in person. UAE field trip in quite a while. The uh, group was at uh, Tel Abraq on Friday. That all went very happily and very smoothly. And we have uh, uh, additional uh, field trips coming up in the, the next few uh, weeks. Uh, at least one has already been announced by email. That's a hike to the uh, uh, Yavanna uh, landslide. Uh, several others are, are uh, coming up in the next few weeks and into January. Uh, for those, watch your emails, members watch your uh, uh, newsletter, uh, and uh, uh, non-members can, uh, can check our uh, website, uh, except that field trips, so we are a membership organization and field trips are limited to members. We are not, uh, we are not a uh, uh, tour group offering services to the general public. Uh, I'm pleased to say that our, our lecture schedule is all booked for several months ahead. I'm just going to mention the, the, the next two upcoming lectures. Uh, the December lecture deserves special mention because it's going to be uh, a, a non-standard format. Uh, we have seeded our uh, monthly place to uh, a program that's being uh, put together by NYU uh, Abu Dhabi, and they will be having two nights of natural history oriented uh, lectures on uh, the on December six and seven. That's the the uh, the end of the uh, the national uh, day uh, period, uh, and those are going to be six to eight in the evening. And they will be a medley of short talks about UAE natural history, and this is in honor, uh, in honor of the or on the occasion of the 50th uh, anniversary. They're celebrating you know, the UAE's uh, environment uh, and uh, biodiversity. Uh, it's a small country, but it has many uh, uh, unusual and world-class environments that are accessible, and uh, so. We will actually, DNHG will actually be a sponsor, uh, but our sponsorship is, is basically limited to seeding them our, our uh, evening place and uh, uh, advertising. So you'll hear more about that by an email and in the, uh, in the next uh, newsletter. Uh, <clears throat> January is going to be, we'll be back on our normal schedule for the first uh, Sunday in the first Sunday of the month in January. We will again be on uh, on Zoom, and the talk will be uh, on uh, tiger conservation by Dr. Sanjay Bibi. Uh, after that, uh, we may be poised. Uh, the committee will be discussing this. We may be poised to go back to in-person meetings, and we will be considering the option of uh, hybrid meetings, which will allow us. Uh, if we can work out the details, which will allow us some of the best of both in-person and uh, uh, Zoom meetings. Zoom in particular has allowed us to, uh, to hear from some people who it would be harder to get in front of us in Dubai. And for all of that, uh, again, uh, check your newsletter and check emails. Uh, the reason I'm referring to, to emails and newsletter, for those of you that don't, uh, uh, aren't necessarily on our list, the way to get on our list is to uh, be a member. We are a membership organization. Uh, our memberships uh, are still, after uh, 35 years or more, uh, one of the best bargains in town at uh, 50 dirhams a, a year for a single 
and uh, uh, 100 dirhams for a family membership. And you can check our, our website for details uh, uh, about that. Our speaker tonight will be uh, uh, Dr. Dave Applin, who's going to talk about surviving ingenious strategies without legs. He's going to be talking about plants, not snakes. Uh, so if you if you tuned in for reptiles, uh, maybe have a have a rethink. But I think you'll be happy you tuned in uh, uh, anyway. Uh, those of you who read the uh, the, uh, the blurb will know that uh, Dave has had an interest in plants since uh, childhood. Uh, it's possible that he still has genes from the first uh, first humans who became agriculturalists. Uh, 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 but in any case, he is, his interest, he has an interest in the diversity of plants, but also in particular in their growth and development. And he's been involved with uh, several botanical gardens uh, internationally. What brought him to the UAE was an association with the, uh, the, Aswad, the, the Sharjah Botanical Garden, which unfortunately has remained uh, aspirational rather than uh, than active. I, I had the personal pleasure of joining him in the field on a couple of occasions. And although I'm uh, pretty well familiar with the uh, uh, UAE plants, uh, I found his the perspectives on looking at them, the kinds of questions he asked, the kind of observations he made to be extremely uh, interesting and valuable. And, and I can only say uh, of him, as I have of a, a few other speakers in the past, that I wish he had come to the UAE uh, sooner uh, and stayed longer and shared his talents uh, with us. But in any case, uh, we're privileged to, uh, uh, to have him with us uh, tonight, and I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Dave Appman. Okay, thank you, Gary. Um, appreciate um, those words. Um, I am one of those people who um, um, not in the UAE at the moment. So I'm taking the advantage of the pandemic and being able to speak to you from um, a, re a rural area, very green area of the UK. Um, you'll see that talking is Rebecca Webb. Um, that's not a pseudonym. Um, it's uh, my wife's machine, so um, um, just to explain explain that. Okay, so as Gary mentioned, um, the title is Surviving Genius Strategies Without Legs. Um, hopefully we haven't lost any um, people interested in snakes. Um, and basically the talk is going to be a gentle foray across um, native plants of the UAE and mentioning some of those um, factors that Gary mentioned about how plants grow, how plants survive, um, such an extreme climate. Um, at first, I was going to do this lecture with UAE plants and other plants. And I've decided that I'll only use UAE plants because um, um, it made it more challenging, shall we say, um, to uh, do the research and to find out how some of these plants survive um, the climate that we have. So, Now, apologies for those who um, are obviously resident and know the UAE very well. Um, I'm just going to spend a few minutes, which may um, enable a few more people to join us, um, just a few minutes explaining um, a little bit of background about the UAE, etc. So the UAE is uh, situated in West Asia and on the Arabian Peninsula. Um, using the standard international measurement, the UAE is about four times larger than the country of Wales. Um, it is divided into seven emirates, which are relatively independent, um, with an overarching national structure. If you look at the map, 
the different colour patches correspond to photographs taken um, on my mobile phone. Um, so the darker, the redder the patches, the more photographs I took and the more interesting the sites were. Um, so you'll see quite a lot in the Haja Mountains there. And these are some of the areas that I will be talking about from some of the plants there. Um, firstly, some people um, uh, may um, be surprised at the diversity of habitats within the UAE, especially if you haven't visited. Um, before I visited, I was totally unaware. So this is um, for, for those people. Um, certainly you get deserts and that makes up majority of the land area, the sand deserts. But there's also some wonderful mountains, um, such as the Haja Mountains, and this borders Oman. Um, and it holds the majority of plant diversity in the United Arab Emirates. Um, they reach to about an altitude of 1,500 meters and over in places, and they comprise of um, very many mountain wadis, such as this. Um, so the mountain wadis are normally dry. Um, sometimes they are roads across the deserts, um, but when it rains, they quickly become flash floods. Um, and uh, rip away all of the vegetation that's not strongly rooted. A little bit about um, how I got to the UAE, Gary briefly mentioned. Um, my role was to develop a botanic garden for um, His Highness the ruler of Sharjah, um, seen, seen here. Um, we did develop a um, garden plan. Um, we hired Grimshaw Architects who designed the Sustainability Pavilion at Expo 2020, which some of you may have visited. They also designed the Eden Project in the UK. So a very high quality architectural firm. They came up with the design, um, even a model, which you can see with the ruler there. Um, sadly, the project for a few reasons uh, didn't break ground and it's been placed on indefinite hold. Um, and I'm certainly not holding my breath for it to um, start again. So the emphasis of my job shifted slightly um, and I became the acting director of the Sharjah Seed Bank and Herbarium. So hopefully a few people may have joined us and uh, I will start the, the bones of the talk. So what I've done broadly is divided this presentation into a number of different topics um, from flowering, traveling, growing, surviving. And I'm, I'll be talking about um, plants that fit into those categories. Now, obviously, in reality, many plants should be in multiple categories. Um, so it's a, a very loose structure, which I'll have for this talk. Um, and also, I've just used plants that I've witnessed myself in the field. And all of the photographs, apart from one, are my own photographs. So these are um, uh, very much a, a personal account of, of my relatively very short time in the field in the UAE. So um, we'll start off with uh, flowering. Um, this is a plant um, called uh, Desmodorcus flava. Um, it's a plant which um, comes from a very specialized family, the Apocanaceae. Um, which are considered very close to, in evolutionary terms, to orchids. They've got extremely specialized flowers, um, whereby some of the male and female parts are joined to create um, interesting flower parts that you don't get in other flowers. Um, so the structures are, are actually can be quite complicated. 
as you'll know with orchids um they um, mimic um um often um, traits through chemical or even um, sight. Um, they may mimic, for example, bees, so the bee orchid, um, to attract bees for pollination. Um, this family, and, and certainly the, 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 the ones that I'll mention, do that as well. So Desmodorcus flava, which you can see there, um, is um, a very interesting mimic. Um, and it's certainly not the shape, but it's more the scent that it gives off and the colour. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is a urine mimic. <laughs> so um, the um, colour of the petals and the volatile odours that are made up of 63 different compounds um, means that they are highly scented um, and they smell like urine. And the reason that they um, hypothesize that the scent is so strong, although to be honest, when I've smelt this in the field, um, I've not found it over strong, but um, I think it probably depends on the time of day and when during the flowering it occurs. Um, urine is probably less attractive for um, insects, for example, Laying eggs into it um, is, is going to be a waste of time. Um, there's nothing to nourish larvae, but you can get a good feed out of urine if, if you're an invertebrate. Um, so basically, it, the idea, or so we think, is that it emits a lot of odour to attract um, insects to come to the flowers for purposes of pollination. The chemical, some of the chemicals are very similar to sex pheromones for beetles. And it's known that beetles um, um, visit this species, um, but it's not been totally observed of whether they pollinate them or not. But um, I suspect they, they probably do. Um, this is what it looks like um, in the field. Um, so a lot of people don't uh, surprisingly don't actually see this plant very often in the field i think mainly because it's hidden in plain sight if you look at this image here um this is a plant which i walked past um on the it was growing next to the track in the harja mountains i walked past it didn't see it and I'm, it was only on my way back that I saw it there and I was just dumbfounded how I could have possibly walked by without seeing it. But if you look at it, it's incredibly well camouflaged with the colour and um, the shape of the rocks. So a lot of people think these species, Desmodorcus flava and Desmodorcus uh, arabica, are very rare. I would say that whenever I was in the Harjo Mountains, I would expect to see them. I would expect probably to see three or four plants. So if if you're in the mountains and, and you're not seeing that, you're probably just missing them. So in order to have an idea of where they come from, I've got a little bit of video which says my voice a little bit. Um, and there's two things that I'd like you to notice. Um, the first is right at the beginning of the video, you will see um, the ends of the petals have little um, trichomes that waver in, in the in the wind. Um, and the next thing w which I'll show you is 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 uh, the location of where they grow in in the wild. So I might play it back twice just in case. So you can see the trichomes moving. And this is the habitat. This is where you need to climb in order to locate them. So I'll play that again. If you look closely at the trichomes at the ends of the petals here, um, it's thought that they are visual attractants for pollinators. So a beautiful spot to grow. And 
another plant that I saw So, as you may have gathered, that was me doing a bit of recording in situ, um, which um, um, certainly helps my voice when I'm when I'm presenting. So you'll see a few of those um, today. As you see, the plant is very succulent. It has um, no visible leaves, um, so it's well adapted for um, dry conditions. In my experience, I, I quite often find it um, near a overhanging rock. That may be luck, um, but um, that, that's uh, a common feature that I've found. So maybe gaining some shade at some part of the day, perhaps, and maybe that's just for germination. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. Okay, so I mentioned there are two different species of Desmodorcus, the Flava on the left-hand side and um, Arabica on the right. Um, Arabica, not a urine mimic. Um, it doesn't leave too much to the imagination to, um, to to see that it resembles flesh. Um, there are um, hair-like growths at the ends of the petals, which just like uh, flava, um, but also the surface of the petals um, have a, a variable, almost hairy texture, whereas flava doesn't and that hair like texture is and patterning is thought to be um, um, a attractant for um, pollinating uh, insects um, generally um, carrion or blow flies um, this is a uh, Periploca, so same family, Apocanaceae, used to be Asclepiadaceae, um, but that's an old family now. So um, it's uh, Apocanaceae. And these are very hairy in, in comparison to um, the Desmodorcus that we, we saw just now. So they have lots of um, hair-like outgrowths, which are interestingly um, um, each of those are just one cell, um, one cell in length, but very elongated cells. Um, and um, a visual attractant is that they they blow in the wind and they um, really do attract lots of flies. So if you see in the next um, picture, and I think I was with Gary when I uh, took um, this bit of video, um, but if you have a look, you can see the flies doing their job. So these are, I believe, the regal blowfly. Uh, but I think there are some other species there as well. Um, I'll just play that once more. Um, so they're pollinating and, and drinking nectar. Um, So moving on a little bit, um, one of the, down from the mountains, one of the interesting species uh, that I saw was the Zygophyllum. Um, bean caper, I think might be its uh, common name. Sorry, I'm, I'm not great at the common name, so please forgive me. But I think uh, the, the pictures of these plants will at least be very familiar to you. Um, so Zygophyllum is very common in the desert plains. It's extremely well adapted to um, the dry conditions. It has um, very small um, succulent leaves. And to be honest, if you look at it, you might think, well, there's not much going on there. But actually, the flowers are minuscule. Um, and you can see... But however, sorry, the flower emits an incredible 
scent for insects um, and it's like a, an island of biodiversity in the middle of a desert where you see a lot of butterflies, um, lots of nectar feeding invertebrates um, with especially bees, etc. Probably moths because of the white flower. Possibly um, moths are, are attracted to, to white, white flowers. Um, and the leaves are also very modified and succulent, as you can see in that image there, um, which uh, are adaptations to hold, hold moisture. So um, an interesting plant, uh, you, you'd automatically think that there was not much going on, but actually it's a hive of activity and I would imagine a very important plant for um, lots of bees and pollinators. Um, just on my finger there, there's just um, the seeds of it, um, just uh, giving you an ind indication. Somebody contacted me some time ago saying they'd never seen the seeds and I happened to pass them and uh, um, I, I, I took that picture. So perhaps one of the most spectacular flowering plants, I would say, of the UAE is this little thing here. Um, it's a wild carnation. Um, it'd be interesting how many people have uh, seen this. Um, sorry, how many have actually seen this in the wild? Um, it's Dianthus crinitus. Uh, I was very fortunate um, because I think I come from horticulture. I think if if I hadn't and I hadn't grown dianthus and carnations, I don't think I'd have ever spotted it, because I spotted this initially when it was not in flower, and if you look at it when it's not in flower, it looks like that. Um, obviously, apart from the middle picture, it looks almost like um, a grass, maybe easily confused with with, with a grass blends in with the surroundings. But I noticed um, growth that is on the right hand image. And um, I immediately knew that that was um, a dianthus. Um, so I was um, very fortunate enough to to find that one. They also grow off in perennial in the shelter of perennial trees. Um, so that further disguises them. But I got a little video and this is the first one I'd seen flowering um, and I'm talking on this video again so it gives my voice a, a, another break but um, let's have a look. So this would be pollinated by um, probably mainly Lepidoptera, um, butterflies, maybe moths. Um, so um, it's a, a, an amazing species to have in the UAE um, records. And um, I would challenge um, people to guess um, that this came from you know, a, a, a desert climate such as the UAE. So the next um, kind of uh, section that I'm, I'm going to talk about is about living together and the alliances that plants have with other organisms. And this is quite an interesting one because it's quite often overlooked. Um, but there is some interesting research out there that um, uh, um, highlights um, the fact that we shouldn't look at plants as individual entities, they are often, as humans, collections of organisms. Uh, we're, we're, we've got more bacteria cells in our body than we have human cells, for example. And um, plants are by no means um, any less um, interesting. Um, this is Ficus cordata, it used to be called Salicifolia, I think, but apparently um, I believe it's, it's uh, cordata. Um, 
the plant on the right was one on, I think on the first visit of this first trip I went with Gary um, we located this specimen um, this was in August it was probably about 43 degrees and, and I was drinking five liters in as many hours um, a great time to be out you don't see many people um, but you know it's, it's it is fascinating to, um, to to be out in in all seasons to be able to appreciate how dynamic um, the UAE's flora and landscape is. So these are the fruits and if you look at the picture in, in the middle um, it's the it's a fig. Um, the fig has a hole in and probably most of you will know but um, some of you may not that figs are pollinated by um, tiny wasps. So uh, when the fruit is young, um, there's a, a small hole which the wasps climb into and then they lay their eggs into the middle of the fruit because the fig, the flower of the fig, um, is inside the fruit. So the wasps clamber around when they um, are laying their eggs and then they hatch out and um, the male wasps um i'm trying to th uh, it's been a while since i looked at this but the, you've got the male and female wasps, and basically they have a good time in in, in the fruit um <clears throat> and they pollinate it in in that way um and um the last um picture there on on, on the end is uh, developing seeds with within the fruit so fortunately, um, the figs that we would buy in the shops, um, they're uh, not pollinated by wasps um, because they're not pollinated, but um, the wild figs are um, absolutely pollinated in that way. And there'll be a specific species for that particular um, fig. <clears throat> so it's an insect who's uh, using the, the fig not only as a home, but also as a breeding ground and uh, to uh, for the larvae to, to grow and develop. A lot of you will be very familiar with uh, Calotropus procurera or Sodom's apple. Um, it is practically everywhere. Um, you can find it in the desert. You can find it half buried in dunes or you could find it on the pavement in Dubai. Um, so this is um, uh, quite an amazing plant really. Um, so much so it's invasive in many countries um, such as Australia etc. Um, so it is, uh, it is a problem. It does have an amazing ability to maintain growth even um, when it's extremely arid conditions and it thrives in areas that have um, about 15 centimeters of rainfall a year. Um, it has a very deep taproot system but it also has remarkable leaves. So leaves, these leaves are chiefly um, form the plant's resilience to the climate um, they have the ability to change their thickness and size in response to how arid the conditions become. And this helps the plant to conserve energy. Um, they're able to maintain a very high photosynthetic rate with using very little water. So you can imagine in an in a arid environment, this is a, a fantastic strategy to have. Um, the leaves are covered in uh, wax and this again reduces the moisture loss from those leaves and also the white colour helps reflect that sunlight. So these are a very useful and important strategies if you want to be successful uh, growing in a very arid climate. Beneath the surface of the leaves <clears throat> there are canals which are fooled, filled with white latex and if you're um, an insect wanting to take a munch out of the leaf um, 
the white latex would basically gum up the mouth parts of the insect and prevent it from feeding. And uh, it's also uh, toxic to many insects. So it's very well um, um, protected. So these are the flowers, which I'm sure you've seen everywhere. Um, but these plants are quite an important plant um, because they are food and shelter for many organisms. Um, and research, research has looked into a number of um, organisms, um, not only on the plant, but within the tissues of the plant. So what researchers have done is they've taken leaf discs, um, which the picture on the left represents, and placed them onto Petri dishes. So the leaf was sterilized, surface sterilized, so that what was placed in the Petri dish was anything that was inside the Petri dish. And what happened um, was a, a lot of um, uh, um, endophytic fungi, a fungi that live inside the plant that you'd never know existed, um, uh, grew and they found that there were over 11 different species of endophytic fungi in a leaf of this particular species. And these fungi are likely to um, um, not so much having a free ride, but they're important for the plant for protecting it from pests and pathogens and also herbivores. So you can see that this plant is incredibly well adapted, incredibly well defended. Um, and uh, it, you kind of almost, if you live in the UAE, take it for granted. But um, it's, it's quite a, a fantastic plant, I think, in many ways, and one that could potentially be used um, a lot more um, for landscaping. You wouldn't need to water it then. There was a plant growing at work um, and every few weeks the gardeners would cut it down and uh, it managed to get to flowering every few weeks um, from being cut down to the ground. Um, in fact, it takes 190 days from the seed germinating to it being mature to be able to flower. So um, it's, um, it is quite an amazing plant. So about 85%, if not more, of all plant species have an association with a fungus. And um, there are endophytes that live in the leaves, but there are also, um, uh, more importantly perhaps for some, fungi that live on the roots and in the soil of the plant. And these are called mycorrhiza. Um, so they tap into the plant, into the cells of the plant, and um, reach out from the uh, roots of the plant to increase the surface area um, of the plant's roots. And what happens is that the plant provides the, um, the, the plant provides the fungus with carbon. And in return, the fungus provides the plants with um, mainly phosphate, but it can also um, give the plant um, water as well and, and other nutrients. So wherever you are in the world, if you look at any plant, the, that plant will have mycorrhiza on. There are a few exceptions, and uh, I think the Probably one of those will be one I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but we shouldn't really look at plants as being just uh, leaves and, and, and roots. They have these extended um, um, areas of mycorrhiza. And probably these mycorrhiza are very important for um, plants in deserts. Um, it's been very little um, studied, um, but anything that increases the plant's ability to get uh, nutrients and, and water um, are, are a major important factor for plants. 
Sandy Soils. Um, I'm running a soil testing company at the moment. So sandy soils, as I know, are very poor in nutrients. So if you can have a fungus that is linked into your roots that go and forage a much wider area, then you've got a, a greater chance of um, acquiring those nutrients and um, that will benefit the plant. So my next um, picture, and apologies for the upturned shoe. I know it can be rude um, for, for some people or some cultures. Um, <clears throat> but my next section is on uh, traveling and how plants move around. Um, obviously plants uh, need to move around and this is a, a, a plant which I probably took far too many pictures of <laughs> um, in the UAE. It was situated just outside of my office building and whenever I needed a screen break I'd go and visit it and other plants as well. Um, so this is uh, that uh, that particular plant. It's called Neurada procumbens. It's an annual, and like the picture you saw just now, that if you go walking in the desert um, or cycling, um, these will attach to your shoes or, or wheels. Um, so a fantastic mechanism for being able to move around. Um, if you have a look at this example, you can see how well armoured it is. Um, incredible spines on on this. And quite variable as well. So there's a, a, a centimetre um, scale down the bottom of this image. Not only um, some of them are very variable in size, but also in in how spiny they are. And it was once considered that there were different species, in fact, subspecies occurring of this, um, but it's seen, been shown through molecular analysis that um, uh, this is not the case. And um, there is just one species, Neurada procumbens. Um, it is quite invasive, and I believe in Australia and uh, many other places. So um, it's it's very well adapted. So you can imagine that the spines will get stuck into um, the feet of um, mammals, for example. However, um, the spines are not just for traveling. Um, so it's only part of the story. Um, so. I'll explain about the the spines in a second, but let's. Whilst I was taking my screen breaks, it, it rained on the 26th of November, and we had quite a lot of rain. And because I was interested in this particular plant, um, I went out there every few days to notice whether it was flowering and, or rather, germinating. And firstly, I noticed. Um, the strange um, architecture of, of the seed. If you were to slice off the top of that seed, you would find a um, seed capsule um, because uh, what you're looking at there is actually technically called a diaspore. And a diaspore is a botanical language for um, a unit of um, dispersal. So what will get dispersed is this particular um, fruit. Um, but within it, there are 10 seeds. And you can see the 10 seeds in the middle of this um, picture here, the black parts. And what happened on day nine, after the rain, they started germinating, so fairly quick. If you look at the seed in this image, then you'll see there's spiny above, but below it's dead flat. And that's important. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So 
when they germinate, they germinate in their masses. And you can see um, a sea of green, not grass, but Neurada procumbens. Interestingly, the seed germinates and the roots grow down the middle of the hole, so the hole in the middle. So here you can see three roots here, and that means that three seeds have germinated. The flat disc here, as opposed to the spiny bit, correspond to the underneath of the um, fruit when it's attached to the plant. So what happens is that uh, the seedlings will start to germinate and they'll grow down. And then if suddenly the rain dries up, they'll die. But when it rains again next, this uh, diaspore will again send out some seeds to germinate. And it will keep doing that until it produces um, a, a, a mature plant or all those 10 seeds have been wasted. So it's an infective uh, mechanism. It's almost like keeping seeds in a seed packet and, and um, waiting for the conditions to, to um, be favorable for them to grow. So on day 40, um, it was a, a mature plant and you can see the flower there. Interestingly, the uh, I looked at hundreds of these plants um, and it was very rare to see the flowers. And that's because the flower only opens for a few hours and then it's gone. So uh, this is uh, the flower here. So I was quite fortunate enough to be able to, to take that picture. And then, interestingly, 10 days later, its life cycle was over. So this plant has gone from um, under 50 days from germination to, to dying, and it's created this woody seed structure. So we talk about often talk about seeds as being annuals and perennials, but certainly in uh, desert environments, they are quite often ephemerals, which means that they um, are very short lived. Um, so 50 days to produce a, um, a plant and set seeds from, from germinating is, is, is quite incredible, really. So I was um, fortunate enough we had a good population so I could monitor them. What I did was I collected some uh, um, diaspores and I put them in a test tube. And a few weeks later, I noticed there was something moving in the test tube. And this is what I found. So what happened is that these are parasitic wasps. So they'd obviously laid their eggs into larvae of something that was eating the seed and they'd eaten the larvae and they'd, um, they'd then hatched out into the test tube. I don't know what they are, only that they're parasitic wasps. Um, th there is some suggestion that there are more parasitic wasp species than there are beetles um, on Earth, but um, who knows? Th th I, I, I would assume that they've not been studied. Um, so an interesting activity if you're out in the field and you collect a few um, fruits or, or seeds, just to put them um, make sure they're dry uh, so they don't rot, but place them in a tube and see what what comes out. I did this for a research project I was doing when I was working on mycorrhiza in the UK. And I was looking at a leaf miner and a parasite that lives on the leaf miner. And we actually found a species which was the uh, first time it had been recorded in the UK. Um, I say we, um, the people who identified them were at the Natural History Museum in London. Um, but um, it's interesting, for all I know, this species of um, uh, um, parasitic wasp may be something new, who knows, something that would be interesting to investigate perhaps for somebody. 
So the next plant I'd like to um, move on to is the Velcro plant. And I'm sure you know it if you've been in the uh, in the mountains. It's a plant that sticks to your trousers. Um, it's not unpleasant, but it's but it has small um, hair, hairs that just stick to um, everything. Um, it's the same family as the stinging nettle, for those who know that. Um, but fortunately, this one doesn't sting. And there's a plant growing in situ on the left, a close up of the hairs in the middle, and the flower um, on the right hand side. So, interesting, we were talking about diaspores before being a unit of, um, uh, of uh, dispersal. Sometimes whole plants of the Velcro plant can be that unit of, unit of dispersal. I've read, I've read papers that have said that the plant breaks off and it blows in the wind and then it releases its, um, its seeds as it travels. I've not witnessed that myself, but I've certainly come home with um, um, branches, um, uh, stems attached to my trousers and, and, and they had um, um, fruits on them. So certainly a, a, a good way of dispersal. So once when I was in, uh, in the mountain, um, I noticed a plant which had a butterfly attached and interestingly this is actually um, um, a, a different species of the um, of the velcro plant but you see this butterfly has actually been attached to the um, spines on the leaf um, so interesting to witness One of my perhaps favorite plants is, um, is a Lactuca, which is a, a member of the lettuce family. Um, this is Lactuca orientalis. Um, not often um, seen in the UAE, only a few sites and um, witnessing this particular plant was a, a first for that particular site in the UAE. Um, it's Asteraceae, which is amazing because this flower does not look like a, an Asteraceae. Um, so it's um, it's quite an attractive thing, um, especially when it's young. You've almost got this uh, snakeskin bark um, on the plant. Uh, its dispersal is through seeds. Um, so uh, just like a, a, a dandelion or many other Asteraceae. Um, but you only have, uh, a, a, I think, maximum of four seeds per flower head. This is it growing wild, and this is actually growing um, on a rock surface. Um, but if you have a look at the rocks anywhere in the UAE, this is what you'll find. You could take whole mountains apart quite easily with your fingers if you really had the time. So you can see how they carve great big chunks out of the mountains. Um, so this is um, basically all these bits of stone make up scree. And I was fortunate enough to take one of those seeds that you just saw, and I grew one in a pot in my home here. And it grew quite well. Um, but then I noticed that at the bottom of the pot, came a shoot so it's obviously propagating by its roots as well so it's actually a, a, a great strategy to have if you're growing in scree and you have the ability to be able to um, sprout out from your roots it's a, a, a great surviving um, survival tactic and also if you're growing on a, um, a, a cliff edge for example then it's a great way to creep along that uh, cliff edge and, and expand. So the Lactuca is, is a little bit similar to another Asteraceae. This is Launia, born Mulleri. And you can see the very typical um, flower there for um, Launia. 
But if you compare it with the Lachuca, you can see how different it is. In fact, um, I have to be honest, when I saw the Lachuca flower and I didn't know what it was, I had no idea uh, what it could be. So it was an email to Gary to try and find out what it was. Um, if you look at this plant closely, you'll see uh, lots of spines on it around here, and that protects the young growth. So the spines are the old inflorescence, the old flowering shoots from the year before, which are retained and then become um, a defense so that it doesn't get nibbled by uh, grazers. So if we look at this video. So that's what it looks like in 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 the wild. Um, so um, um, quite quite an interesting um, plant. Moving on to another dispersal um, way of uh, way of propagating itself. This is called Comicarpus stenocarpus, which again is quite a, a, a not sure rare, but shall I say, um, not very well recorded plant of the UAE. And this is one that I um, discovered in a new area in Masafi. If you look at these, these are the fruiting um, bodies. And what happens, you can see these got glands upon them. What happens if you brush past them, or an animal does, and it sticks to your clothing. Um, so it, it uh, transports the whole seed pod somewhere else. And this is a video I made, I think. Maybe not. Nope, that's not working. Okay. So it's uh, certainly an interesting plant um, and uh, one worth looking out for. So another category is uh, growing um, and strategies that plants use in order to gain their sustenance. So obviously most plants just put their roots into the ground and their leaves in the air and they get photosynthesis and nutrients from the soil. Um, however, if you've got no leaves and no roots like um, this parasite or a banky, then you have to rely on a um, host plant for nutrition. This or a banky um, is one that um, depends on members of the potato family, the Solanaceae, um, to uh, rob um, the nutrition. They basically got very small seeds, less than half a millimeter, and they only germinate when the seeds detect chemicals from the roots of the potential host plant. And when they germinate, they can only germinate a couple millimeters because the seeds are so small and then the reserves are gone. So they have to be very close to the, um, the host, plant, the host um, roots. Um, because the seeds are so small, they don't have much energy and, and that's um, why it, it has little ability to, uh, to hunt out the, its host when it germinates. But once it does germinate and it, it detects a host, then it is able to attach onto the host root um, with a specialized structure called a hustoria. And this basically taps into the, um, the root. In reality, it's quite a complicated procedure. Um, and there's a range of interactions going on between the host and the parasitic plant. Um, and I guess it's a little bit like walking through a series of doors with um, um, a bunch of keys and, and locked doors. Um, only um, some plants are able to attach themselves um, onto their host plant. But once attached, it siphons off the nutrients and 
um, it is also able to create hormones which facilitate um, the amount of nutrients that it receives from, from the host. So in effect, the host thinks that this plant is just a branch and um, it just siphons off the, the, the nutrients as if it's a part of its own plant. So this has actually become quite a major agricultural pest in some countries, targeting plants from um, um, the potato family, such as tobacco. And the, the problem is you don't know this plant, um, if you're an agriculturalist, you don't know this plant's there until it flowers because um, it's, it's totally underground all the time, doesn't have any roots and doesn't have any leaves and is totally dependent upon the plant and robbing it from its nutrients. The plant that um, this particular plant was hosting upon is this one. Um, it's um, Lycium shorii which is a goji berry um, native to the, the UAE, um, obviously um, the potato family Solanaceae. And that picture we've seen. Um, there are other parasitic plants in the UAE that I've been fortunate enough to see, the Cistache tuberosa, which is, uh, I think, a desert candle or something like that. Um, and there's a, a dodder, which is this plant here, which, um, uh, again, um, germinates. It's less host-specific, but it, it attaches directly to the host using these uh, historia, these special structures, and it robs the plant of uh, its nutrition and usually climbs all over the plant and um, just a, a mass tangle like it is there. Of course, it has no um, advantage of um, killing the plant um, but um, because it, it, it needs the plant alive because um, all these plants are annuals, so they die, they set the seeds and then they start off again. Um, yeah, I conscious um, I'm running close just after um, the hour, um, but we did start a bit later, so I hope that um, you'll be able to bear with me for a little bit longer. So now looking at strategies for living in hostile places, and uh, many people would be surprised to um, know, I'm sure you won't be, but um, the UAE has quite a good collection of liverworts and ferns and algae. Um, and there's just a selection of um, ones that I saw. I used to enjoy uh, finding these. Um, this is, for example, a, a, a stream in a wadi. Um, and just showing you algae there. And the grass is growing. So ideal environments. Hold on, my computer is just giving up. Do you bear with me? I think it's probably gone to sleep. <laughs> is anybody there? Um, I can see an image. Uh... Can you? Yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, okay. I can't see anything. That's interesting. There is an image there. Yes. We're still with you, Gary. It's your original. It's your first image of the uh, uh, algae uh, coating uh, rocks in the wadi. Okay. Started the video. It's weird that I can't see a thing. I wonder why that is. There had to be a technical fault, didn't there? No, I'm just trying to think what it might be, because uh, all is okay here, and we are sharing amongst a lot of sure. people. I've also got a strange noise on my microphone. What I might need to do is just um, quickly go back and come back in, if that's... Okay. Are we okay for time? 
We're we're fine on time, Dave. We're okay. we're getting. Uh, uh, I repeat. I, I wish. Uh, I wish we'd heard a lot of this years ago. Okay, uh, let me uh, bear with me. Talk amongst yourselves for a couple minutes, and I'll try and get it back. Okay, Thank you. Fine. Thanks I'll for your patience. Admit, I'll try and readmit you. Okay. I might be. Becky. You still there? I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. I have no idea what's gone wrong with this screen. Can you just can you just back up one slide or or two? That's that's my simple minded equivalent of kicking the uh, kicking the bumper. I think he's left us, Gary. Yes, he's definitely left us, but that at least is progress if the aim was to leave us and come back. Yeah, I'm just watching out for him. Second. Um, one second. Okay, we're we're, we're good to go again. Uh, apologies for that. So I was talking about um, uh, um, ferns and mosses and algae that uh, grow in the UAE if you find the right site. Um, I'd just like to show you three very brief videos here. Um, one, um, unfortunately with my mouth open, um, but um, I'll just uh, show you it. So there you go. There's if you want to find ferns and you find the mountain, um, north facing slopes are fantastic. 
and Aninchium shown here is probably the the most the commonest um, fern species um, you, you are likely to find. Um, the Dave, next one, uh, Dave, I have to break in to comment. Uh, it, it wasn't critical earlier, but uh, I, I don't know if others are having the same problem. But I have not I have not heard the uh, the uh, video portion of uh, the, the sound portion of any of your videos, and I see someone's got a message here that. Uh, they're having the same problem. Uh, I don't think you can count on us hearing the sound, so you may have to uh, fine. annotate it a bit. Okay, no, thank you for, for telling me that. Um, so um, the, the one that you just saw where flies were attached to my head, um, that was just uh, explaining there that this is um, a Ninchium divericatum, and it grows on a north-facing aspect um, of, of mountains um, and usually on an under overhang of, of a rock and you can uh, quite often find it growing there. Um, this plant here is the maidenhair fern which um, is wadi shish um, near the, um, the, the pond area so quite easily accessible um, but a beautiful fern. Um, it used to be native in the UK um, until it was collected um, totally. Um, and this, okay, so this is Jebel Jace um, and a Wadi. And what I find, which isn't unusual, in a very shaded spot is some liverwort which are looking extremely healthy. So liverworts in the UAE, which um, a lot of people wouldn't realize uh, um, would exist. So um, quite a interesting flora there in the mountains. Whoops. OK. Um, if you go right up the top of the mountains, this is Glossonema variens, which is, um, again, um, um, a Apocanaceae. Um, it's a, a, a beautiful plant. It has uh, annual stems. So these stems grow and in the winter and they produce flowers. Then when it gets too hot, they die down and you wouldn't even know it was there apart from a few seed pods. And then it waits until the cooler weather before shooting out again. So basically a, a way that a plant um, overcomes, or this plant overcomes an unfavorable season is to hide underground. Um, you all know that um, the mangrove, Avicinia marina, um, um, dominates um, the coastal line and certainly would do even more than it is now. Um, it is there because it can tolerate the salt. If you look at the um, leaf in the central picture, the whiteness on the leaf, that's basically salt being exuded from the leaf. So um, obviously there's too much salt in, in, in the water. Um, it gets into the plant, but it gets rid of it by um, excreting it on the, on the leaves. And if you didn't know, these little brown structures here that appear um, along the mud, are uh, breathing roots for the um, for the mangrove. So all roots have to breathe, um, and you can't breathe if you're in saturated mud. Um, so it breathes by sticking up these um, interesting roots. So spiny plants are also um, a way of um, uh, protecting yourself. This is uh, Echinops here, um, which I really like this species. It looks like someone's having a snowball fight in the middle of a, of a desert. Um, but the young plants um, and, and the old plants, but the younger plant in the right hand image is just full of spines. So nothing much is, is going to eat that. Um, Blepharis ciliaris, um, the eyelash plant, again, is full of spines. Um, so extremely well defended. Um, as defended as any uh, cacti from the Americas. 
and this is the uh, centauria uh, a knapweed um, as we would call them in the uk and this one the involucre brax um, around the flower are just full of vicious spines so um, uh, it's again very well defended Again, spines, convolvulus, acanthocladus, which grows in, in the mountains, and beautiful grey foliage, um, but full of uh, vicious spines. Um, and um, Gary here um, at a site, which I, I can't remember exactly where it is, although I can picture it. Um, this is Ocradinus arabicus, a huge specimen growing in this gravel here, no competition. And you can see there's uh, some massive spines there. The berries here for the birds, and obviously you have to be very careful to be able to get the berries without getting spiked on these uh, massive spines. So conscious a, a, a little bit of the time, so um, I'm almost at the end. Um, so this is quite an interesting plant, Leptodemia pyrotechnica. Pyrotechnica is, um, comes from um, the word for fire. And if you look at the middle image, um, you can see the pappus of the seeds. And apparently they were collected to help uh, light fires um, by people many, um, many years ago. Um, attractive flower um, and a very short um, trunk. Some people do classify it as a tree. Um, I guess it depends on what you want to, what, what your definition is of a tree. Um, the interesting thing about this plant is that it has very deep roots and very spread out roots. So. Um, in a paper that I was reading recently, a very small bush, um, the roots can reach 11 and a half meters deep and a spread each side of the plant of 10 meters. Um, and it is estimated that the amount of um, water in that desert soil that it inhabits would be sufficient for that plant to survive for four years without any increment of rainfall so um, quite a, um, a bomb proof plant really so humans well um, what can I say about that um, Gary would have seen the vast changes that have happened in the UAE um, I was there relatively a short time and I could certainly see the changes happening um, this is uh, Prosopis cinerea, the gaff tree, and I quite like this image because you've got these uh, big lorries facing it. Uh, this is in the middle of a construction, but of course the tree um, is against the law to fell the tree. Um, so it's saying there defiantly against these lorries, even though these lorries are being very intimidating. This is, was the new road that has gone from Sharjah to Corfu Khan. Um, scraping a huge amount of the rock and of course you lose this um, beautiful um, russet brown of the rock once it's been taken um, taken off so um, yeah quite a quite a scar these are some that I would say one of the most attractive areas in the UAE um, However, obviously, it was necessary for a road to, to, to go through. This is a site that um, Gary has visited um, with me a few times. Um, this is my most favorite site in the UAE. It's um, near Masafi. Um, it's an area that um, has two distinct geological um, bedrocks and the majority of the interesting plants that I found have been in this area. If we have a look at this area and concentrate on this patch around here, um, and this is just another picture, we can see that during my time, um, excavations were taking place um, and they were taking away um, the gravel from the site and slowly working their way up the hill. I would be possibly relaxed in that um, 
a lot of the more interesting vegetation is higher up. However, um, seeing what can happen and how quickly mountains can be carved up, um, I, I uh, am a little bit concerned. Um, and then, of course, another impact is the grazing that, that occurs. So, um, yeah, there'll be a lot more interesting flora if it wasn't for the grazing. And, and, and uh, um, that's just one of the things. But then humans have to live in the environment um, and we are part of it. It's just how we adversely affect that environment. So just moving on to my last slide and I'd like to thank you for um, your attention and sorry for the uh, for the technical difficulty during the middle of this perhaps the recorded version will um, iron out that issue um, but um, I'm very happy to attempt to answer any questions that you may have um, thank you for your time Thanks very much. Um, I have sent out a, a message to everybody to ask questions, but I haven't got any coming through as yet. Okay, that's easy. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, it has, it's starting, it's starting. It's, okay. Uh, this is from Amelie Mouton. I've met with Bedouins in Ras Al-Khaimah, and they said that the rainfall has dramatically decreased in the past few years. So that's just a statement more than a question. Okay, that's... Really interesting, yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, global uh, sorry, warming is going to make a difference, and we, we don't know. Sorry, um, we don't know where what's going to happen. Sorry, Emily, were you there? Sorry. Yeah, sorry, because I I I I, I couldn't finish typing my question on time. Ah, no worries. <laughs> So no, it's just because they, they said that they, a lot of plants actually disappeared uh, from the mountain because they used to, to go to the mountain to collect the plants for, you know, using for preparation, like for healing preparation or, you know, cosmetic preparation. And all, they said that the amount of plants that disappeared is like huge. So I I just wonder if the this is something you've also noticed during your own research or is it in the conversation here, like yeah. uh, the fact that the... It's, I, th I think, well, uh, I, can't re I can't answer that in, in an authoritative way. All, all I can say is um, that uh, in the 1970s, the UAE was um, very much a, a back, backwater. And um, uh, I suspect that all the changes have happened since then um, dramatic development into the mountains um, which is one of the most prized or i think the most prized um, possession that the uae has um, and it's it's very sad to hear that um, a lot of the plants have gone possibly through grazing as well um, i have seen some interesting case studies which which I, I i probably shouldn't comment about um but um yeah no, it's it's it is uh it is a concern and um maybe some people are, are monitoring that I'm, I'm sorry i can't maybe somebody here can can give you a better answer than me waffling can i can i interject on on that the uae Please. uae climate we know has gone up and down, series of wet years, series of dry years, and so on. Uh, that's been up and down. What hasn't been up and down is the population of the UAE, the foreign population, but also the local population. And so to the extent that the, the people you're speaking with are missing plants that were used traditionally if I had to bet on what's the most likely cause, it's that it's that there's there's more uh, there are more humans wanting to use those uh, those plants than that the uh, and 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 there have been more uh, more goats and camels uh, uh, out grazing than there were in earlier years than that it's a climate uh, matter. 
Uh, certainly the climate is overall getting warmer, but we have good data for the last uh, 30, 40 years of rainfall here, and it's, it's up and down. It's not just for the last few years. Right. Um, I'm going to ask Le. I'm going to unmute. Ask Leith to unmute, and he's got a quite a long question to ask. Leith, can you? Oh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, David. Thanks for a very interesting talk. I had a few questions. Um, one that relates to soil and um, working in the landscape industry. I realise how much topsoil is extracted from other areas within the UAE to be used in the landscape industry. Um, one, I'd just like to ask if you think using native species plants could reduce the need for importing topsoil for, from other locations within the UAE. And two, have you um, seen or do you have an idea about the scale of the problem regarding the sustainability of topsoil extraction? Okay. Um, one, certainly growing natives will... Um, will aid be, um, not having to use topsoil because they are UAE plants are, are, are you know used to um, very poor arid conditions um, I think a lot of the time people use the topsoil is because it has more organic matter in it and that holds moisture and um, growing exotic plants that's what they're going to lack during the, during the growing season um, also, there's the water element. Um, if you grow native plants, then you're going to need much, much less water, hopefully no water, um, as, as, as they get established. Um, I haven't personally um, seen anything with regards to topsoil extraction in the UAE, so I can't comment. Um, I know that you can buy um, peat um, in the UAE, which is incredible, really. Um, it's uh, non-sustainable and it's something that nobody should be using in, in horticulture. Um, the UK has been trying to ban it for probably 35 years and it's only just probably getting there. Um, so, uh, yes, it is a problem, but growing native plants will certainly be um, a major answer to that problem. Okay, thanks. And if I could ask my second question, so yep. straight after that. Um, you mentioned tap roots as a strategy to ensure um, water supply. Uh, I'm just curious about um, artificial in irrigation, of course, because we use that a lot in the irrigation industry. Um, does that discourage the development of tap roots? And in the case of trees, um, what effect would this have on anchorage if it indeed has any effect, because I know that other lateral roots also provide anchorage. Yeah, okay. Um, not all plants have tap roots, um, for one. Um, mm. For those that do, um, I would imagine that they would be, if they can find, if roots can find sufficient moisture in the top layer, then that is where the majority will be. Um, for example, the Leptodenia pyrotechnica, which I, I mentioned, which I think would be a fantastic landscape shrub if pruned back regularly, um, that goes down to 11.5 metres, but within that 11.5 metre depth of soil, it, um, it, it the roots basically colonise the wettest part of that soil. Um, so if you're um, wettest part of the soil is just on the on the surface, and that's where most of the roots will be. And then when you turn the taps off or, or a pipe breaks, that's that's when your plant will die. Um, so that is the, um, the 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 potential issue there. There are some soil ameliorants. That I'm trying to um, trying to get the trying to remember the name of, and I don't think I will during this uh, during this um, answer. Um, but they come from. All over the place. One comes from Australia, and it's supposed to significantly increase the um, water retention of um, soils. So you, you're probably already aware of that. Austral, there's Austral blend. Yes, Austral blend. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Zero but, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Okay, um, can I add one more question? Sure. Um, I think, I think <laughs> in fairness, I, I, think, I think in no, fairness, I think we have to give to the or other people. Nice, sure. nice, nice try. <laughs> but I think in fairness, we, we really have to move along. Yeah. Fair enough. Because we have a few more questions, Gary. Do we are oh, that people have got oh, questions? Yeah, I, I'm sorry. When I said move along, I mean we have to move along to another questioner. I yeah. think Dave. I think Dave is. Uh, I understand that we've gone on a, a little bit long, but I think this is this is the kind of opportunity that to with the you know the D, this is what the DNHD is here for. So okay. we can hang on a few minutes, and certainly if if uh, I know it's late there. Anyone, anyone who wants to leave is welcome to leave. Thank yous are assumed because it was an excellent presentation. But, but let's do move to another question. Okay. I'm going to ask Will Bennett to, un, to un, um, unmute. Uh, Will, are you there? I'm here, yes. Okay. Thank you very one, much. okay, what I'm going to say with you is one question and then so others can have a turn. Sure, sure. Well, thanks Dave for a fascinating talk. Um, my question was a fairly general one, just to ask you what the, you think are the potential opportunities, particularly with using native plants in designed landscapes and, and urban landscapes. Uh, and in particular, I'm quite interested in, in the opportunities of bringing a lot of these plants together in mixed plantings. And if you see that as something which might potentially work um, or, or may not for for some particular botanical reason that I'm not aware of. So I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. I think it's a huge opportunity for UAE plants to become a much um, more prominent part of the landscape scene um, within the UAE. And of course, there are no endemic species in the U UAE. So we're talking um, Arabian Peninsula wide using um, native plants. I think the issue is that getting people to understand the reasons why they're used and um, to get people to appreciate their, their own flora. So that's um, what I think is, is, is of, of major um, importance there. I think as long as plants have the same type of environment or the same, they sort of keep the same kind of conditions, there's probably no reason for mixing UAE plants with um, other plants. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, I can't see any, any, any concerns. The biggest concern, however, is supply. Um, yes. Where do you get UAE plants from? Now, one of the major things that I wanted when we're developing the Botanic Garden was to have a UAE plant nursery where we could supply plants because we knew that by showcasing UAE plants, there would be a demand. And if the demand is not there, then some people might dig them up in the wild and they would obviously die. But the idea is to, to get plants um, uh, available so that uh, the landscape sector and individuals can purchase them if they want them. OK, I'm going to, thank you. I'm going to announce uh, Nuri to ask the quest, a question. Sure. Nuri, can you go ahead? Uh, thank you for the opportunity. It's, this is such an interesting talk by Dr. Dave Applint, and I want to ask about the liverwort. I actually encountered a liverwort last year when the rain happened, with, when we have abundance of rain, and I took a specimen of it. I, told, I talked to Gary, and Gary said he will come back to me uh, later on, but I think so we are busy with many things. So I want to ask Dr. Dave if any literature I can use for the identification of liverwort in UAE. Thank you. Ooh, um, I think there was a recent-ish paper um, that spoke about the ferns, but I also think it spoke about the liverworts. Um, so I think probably the best thing, if you could um, send me your email, um, then I will um, take a look, find out, find that paper, and send you 
the reference if I can't find the actual hard copy of the paper, if you like. Um, in Gary's, in fairness to Gary, he's been um, extremely busy, um, so I'm, I'm sure he will get back to you. However, I, I'm happy to search if you can provide me with your email address. Sure, sure. I will send. E I have your email, sir. So I will send. Perfect. You email. Thank, so, thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks, Nuri. And I'm now going to ask Claudia to come on. Um, she has a question, and I think we'll end it there then. Sure. Claudia. Hi, Claudia. Are you there? I haven't. She's not. Can you hear me? Yep, we can now. Okay. First of all, thank you very much for this excellent talk. I really enjoyed it. And okay. I have to tell you, you are the first that puts Calotropis Procara into a good light. <laughs> all the other botanists hate it. Yeah. And actually, I don't <laughs> understand it because I find, find this plant pretty fascinating and also its connection to the monarch butterfly everyone likes the butterfly yep. and everyone hates the plant and this is what i absolutely yeah i don't understand it so first of all my question um the first question is how can the, when and how does the plant change the thickness of its leaves and does it have any negative in impact on other plants um, like Prosopis juliflora, or do you see no negative impact of this plant? Um, okay. I think if it wasn't for humans, there probably wouldn't be a negative impact of this plant. I think um, humans create environments where this plant is able to be opportunistic um, and grow. And I think because it's so common, and you cut it back and it still comes comes back and it's really difficult to wash off the latex people get a bit um, fed up with it unfortunately um, so with regards to does it affect any uh, I, I read a paper recently um, that mentioned that the um, leaf litter could reduce the germination ability of um, seedlings coming up around um, uh, Calotropus. So um, I could try and find that paper and, and uh, if, if you particularly wanted to know, know more about it. Um, there's also another good paper which specifically mentions about the leaf um, changing and what it seems to be that as it gets hotter and drier, um, the leaf um, gets larger and thinner. Now, that would be the opposite to what I would imagine, because I would have thought yes. that, that, yeah. But um, according to this paper, that's what it that's what it tells me. Um, and again, if if you wanted um, me to send you a copy of that paper, I'm I'm happy to do that. Um, yeah. Please. <laughs> um, if uh, 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 do you have my email address? Dave, can I put it? That's what I was going to ask you. Can I put yes. the email address on for everyone and those? Absolutely. Who okay. Absolutely. I'll put it on now, and then they can email you because there are a lot of more questions, and I think we should call it a wrap, and then we'll take it from there. Sure, but thank you, Claudia, for your question. It's um, I, I think Calotropis is is fascinating. I think the problem is it doesn't it doesn't look as if it fits in anywhere, but if it's not native to the Arabian Peninsula, where is it native to the Moon? I don't know. Yes. It's it's an interesting it's an interesting plant. Okay, Gary, where's our friend Gary? Yeah, I, it, it, there's just a, a time delay. I, let me. Uh, uh, we are on for a long uh, time. Uh, we could certainly have gone on for more. I, I think I can uh, can sum up my thanks by re repeating what I knew was going to be the uh, the case from uh, uh, from having uh, uh, heard uh, Dave's uh, wisdom and experience before, uh, which is that uh, I wish, and now I think most of you wish that uh, he had come to the uh, UAE sooner, 
that we had heard him sooner and that we had stayed longer because we will all look at the uh, environment and particularly the plants around us with a little bit of a different eye now. So thank you very much, uh, Dave. Uh, we normally, in, in in-person lectures, you, uh, you, we would have a small memento for you. I'll have to consider sending you a virtual memento. Uh, <laughs> no need. <laughs> or, or, or you may simply get lots of emails from, uh, from listeners. So thank you, thank you <laughs> very much. Uh, we look forward to seeing all of you uh, at the, the program, which we are sponsoring jointly with the NYU Abu Dhabi in of course that's the 50th the uh, national day celebration on the monday and tuesday the uh, 6th and 7th of december and we'll get more information to you about details of that thanks very much everybody and thanks, thanks particularly to uh, michelle and alexis and pradeep and our other committee members uh, who are making these things happen while I sit in uh, sit in New York, uh, waiting to get things together and come back and see you all. Thanks a lot. Right, just one more, just one last thing. Thanks very much, Dave, and thanks Gary for getting hold of Dave to give this presentation to us because it's been really well received. I'm going to be sending an email to Dave requesting permission in email for the recording because there's a lot of requests coming through now for the recording to be loaded. So I'll oh. be sending that uh, email through tonight. So uh, you, you, thank you, you for a really good talk. It's very well received. And many messages of thanks are coming through. Uh, well, well, everybody is, is very welcome. It's a subject that I'm passionate about. Unfortunately, it was beyond my control that my time in the UAE was, um, shall we say, cut short. But um, that's life, but um, hope to be one day back out in the field and um, looking at the plants again. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, Thank you bye bye. Much. You're welcome. I'm going to bring it to an end now. Thank you, everybody, for your attention, and we'll be putting a recording up to get the email. Thank you very much, then. Good night, everybody.